every single electronics project has some sort of output. Why else would we make them? This output can be in the form of LEDs or LCD displays. But what about interacting with a computer? Well, the traditional method of doing so is via the serial port. This is the most widely used because of its simplicity. Rewind a few decades and you will find many more computers with serial ports. But if you have noticed, these ports have been long since replaced by USB. USB has brought massive advantages to the electronic space, most notably for the consumer. For them, it is very easy to use. Just plug it in and the computer will handle the rest. Much more convenient than the traditional serial devices, which had to be manually configured. The only problem is that USB is very complicated considering that the datasheet is over 600 pages long. For this reason, implementing USB is no easy task for the engineer. Luckily for you, you're in the right place. And in this video, I will be showing you how you can implement USB into your electronics projects. The first and most logical step is to select a microcontroller that will interface to our computer using USB. And it can't be any old microcontroller. The infamous Mega328 will not be suitable here. Instead, I'm looking at a very similar microcontroller, which is the Atmega 16U2. Why did I pick this microcontroller specifically? Well, for a few reasons. First, it is extremely similar to the original AVR series, such as the Mega328. That means you won't have to learn too many new skills just to use the USB. Second is that it is fairly available, with it being in stock on Mouser, with more to come later this year. Finally, and perhaps the most important, it has a hardware USB implementation. Some of you may have already come up with an objection with regards to the Mega328, which would be that we could use the vUSB library. Yes, it is true that you can use such a software library to bitbang USB. But for beginners, I believe that it is best to stick to hardware USBs. Who knows, I may just upload a vUSB video in the future as well. If you don't want to use this microcontroller specifically, you may pick up another. Just make sure that it has USB capability. Also be warned that this video may not align with it completely, although the general ideas will be the same. You will most likely make a prototype for your first project as well. And in a lot of cases, that is done on a breadboard or perf board. With that in mind, the first thing you may notice about this microcontroller is its size. I mean, it's smaller than my thumb. What happens next really depends on how comfortable you are with SMD soldering. If you are comfortable, then feel free to produce your own dev board or solder it to an adapter board. If you aren't comfortable, then take a look at these adapters. They're pretty huge, but no surface mount soldering is required. It also makes it really easy to swap the microcontroller in case you fry it. Anyways, for the assembly of the prototype, I set up the bare minimum components required to run the microcontroller, along with a few buttons and LEDs for testing purposes. These microcontrollers require very few parts to function, but there is one component that you will need to properly use USB, and that is either an 8 MHz or 16 MHz crystal. This is because the USB hardware requires a 48 MHz clock, and the internal PLL needs either an 8 or 16 MHz clock to generate those 48 MHz. You will also need two 22 ohm resistors in series with the USB data lines. Anyways, the circuit is really simple with a few extra parts. Go check the link in the description if you want a schematic that you can follow along with. The next part is just soldering our prototype together. I didn't bother to make a PCB for this case since I wanted to get to the software as quickly as possible. I did end up using the solderless adapter though since this will make for a useful drop in programmer down the line if I feel the need to. Feel free to make a PCB at this stage if you want or just place everything else on the breadboard. Now for the part that you have all been waiting for, the USB protocol. This is also the hard part, so buckle in. To write code for USB, you should probably understand how it works at a low level, which I will explain now. If you are interested in the explanation and want to skip ahead, feel free to do so. Anyways, we will start at the lowest level of the protocol, which is the bits themselves. Taking a look at the physical USB interface, we have four connections. One is power, another is ground, and the other two are D plus and D minus. These aren't your typical data lines, where one is a clock and the other is data. Rather, USB uses what is called a differential pair. It's called that because the data lines usually have inverted logic states from one another. This is useful for eliminating noise, which can be a big deal at the high speeds that it can reach. But how can it use essentially just one signal to deliver so much data? Where does one bit end and the other bit begin? Well, let's take a look. First off, I need to explain some relevant terminology. There are four basic states, J, K, 
a single ended zero, and a single ended one. J and K are opposites of each other, and their polarities depend on whether you're running in low or full speed. They also set D plus and D minus opposite each other, as in D plus would be high and D minus would be low for J in a full speed mode, and the opposite in low speed. K is always the opposite of J. This is how a speed is determined by the computer as well. The J state is the idle state, and whichever polarity it is in will determine the speed of the communications. There are two more levels, which are a single ended zero and a single ended one. They are exactly what they sound like. Either are both ones or both are zeros. Now these levels by themselves do not represent the ones and zeros of the data, however. For that, we use a special form of data transfer. And the special form of data transfer is called the NRZI line coding. It stands for non-return to zero inverted. Basically, we are looking at the transitions between the J's and the K's to retrieve our data. Let me draw the lines in between the bits here. If there are two J's or two K's in a row, we see no transition. Then that means we will get a one for our data in return. But if there is a transition from a J to a K, or inversely, a K to a J, we will get a zero for our data. As you can see, the J's and the K's themselves do not carry the data. Rather, the transitions do. This is also how the devices can recover some sort of data clock without having a dedicated clock pin. That's also why the transfers always start with a KJ, 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 KK sync pattern so that both sides get an idea of how fast a clock is. But our problem arises if there are too many non-transitions in a row and the clock would be lost. That's why the protocol requires some bit stuffing, where a transition is forced after six consecutive non-transitions. This transition does not count as part of the data. And finally, an end to the data is represented with a single ended zero. That brings us up the chain into the next highest level of organization, which is comprised of packets. If you're familiar with internet communication, this is sort of a similar idea. Each packet is a tiny bit of information put together into one sort of package. The first part of every packet is the sync that we just talked about. Then comes the PID. The PID basically tells us what the packet is about, whether it is data, addressing, or acknowledgements. The PID is only four bits long, and the other four bits of it are just the bitwise complements of the first four bits. Afterwards, we may or may not have some more data depending on what the type of packet is, but more on that in a second. Finally, at the end of the packet, we have an EOP, which stands for end of packet. Each EOP is comprised of a couple of single ended zeros and a J. And this is the basic structure of every single packet that we will talk about. But with so many different types of data, we need a way to organize these packets. And there are actually three types of packets that you should be aware of. The first type is a token packet. These packets are only sent by the host, so no devices are allowed to send these on their own. They basically initiate communication. These packets use four distinct PIDs, out, in, setup, and start a frame. Out and in are self-explanatory. They indicate that the next packet will either be a host or device, or device to host data transfer. The setup is similar to an out, but it has more to do with the device configuration. Out, in, and setup PIDs are all followed by 7-bit device addresses in a 4-bit endpoint. That means that each bus can have at most 127 devices attached. And endpoints are device-specific data locations that indicate different functions for the data being received, but more on endpoints later. The final PID and token packets are start of frames, SOFs. SOFs are not as important, but they basically denote the timing of the USB. They occur every one millisecond, and no devices should respond to it. They should only take note of it. The next type of packet is the data packet. Data packets follow after a token packet and are either in the in or out direction. The PID of a data packet can either be a data zero or a data one. There's little real difference between the two PIDs other than the device must alternate between them on each consecutive data packet. After the PID, you'll find the actual data. For full speed devices, you can have up to 64 bytes per data packet. But in low speed devices, you are limited to just 8 bytes. After the data, there's a 16 bit CRC to ensure the correctness of the data. And finally, we have the handshake packet. This is the smallest packet of the three because it is literally just a PID. The three PIDs are acknowledge, not acknowledge, install. Acknowledge and non-acknowledge are self-explanatory in that the device either received the data correctly or is too busy to deal with it. The stall is a little bit different because it means there is an outstanding error that needs to be resolved.
I organized the presentation of the previous three packets because I wanted you to see how they are all connected. And the combination of the three packets in this order will get what is called a transaction. The host initiates all transactions because, remember, the host is the only one who can issue a token packet. They are also named after the token packet PIDs, which are either in, out, or setup. Going further, collections of the transactions are grouped into categories called transfers. And there are four basic types of transfers. Control transfers are used for command and status operations that are initiated by the host. Control transfers can be used for things like getting device information when it is initially plugged in so that the host knows what to do with the new device. Isynchronous transfers are transfers that occur continuously and with time sensitivity. For example, audio applications where the sound data must be continuously streamed so that the continuity is not broken in the sound. That means that if an error occurs, no attempt at retransfer will occur so that timely continuity is preserved. Interrupt transfers are similar to isynchronous transfers in that they occur regularly. The difference is that the data transmitted is small. This means that it can be repeated to ensure full data delivery. This is useful for applications like keyboards. The final transfer type is the bulk transfer. This is for large amounts of data that don't have to be transmitted quickly. Things like hard drives and mass storage devices will use bulk transfers. Since the host controls all data transfers on the bus, you may be wondering how it differentiates between each transfer method. Well, for that, we have to look at device endpoints. An endpoint on a device is sort of like a destination or origin for certain data. A keyboard might use endpoint 1 for the keys press, for example. Each endpoint has to configure itself in a certain way, such as which transfer type to use and whether data comes in or out of it. Endpoint 0 is the only required endpoint and it must always be configured. Since it is also a control type endpoint, data can go both in and out of it. Besides endpoint 0, full speed devices can have up to 15 extra endpoints. Low speed devices can only have two additional endpoints. Speaking of endpoint 0, it is the endpoint that the host uses to initialize the communication with the device. To set up the device, the host will first give it a new address, since every new device starts with address 0. Once the device has received the new address, Further configuration can occur in the form of descriptors. Descriptors are exactly what they sound like. They describe the device and its functions. There's data for the manufacturer of the device, what it can do, and much more. Okay, that was a lot of information on USB. Let's get to the fun part and actually implement it. If you wanted to, you could simply use the core USB peripheral and its registers. But I do not recommend that simply for the reason that it can get very messy and very confusing. That's why I recommend using some sort of library either the official microchip ASF USB library or the open source LUFA library. I'll leave a link to both in the description. For this introductory example, we will be creating a USB keyboard using the LUFA library. This is the best project to learn USB with since the device logic is simple and you don't have to write any drivers for your PC. To get started with it, simply download the files to a directory. I'd recommend copying the keyboard demo so that you have an example of what to work with. First, edit your makefile. In our case, the MCU should be at the Atmega 16U2. If you decided to use a 16 MHz crystal instead of an 8 MHz one, change the FCPU value to that. And finally, change the LUFA path to where you have installed LUFA. Since we are using the Atmega 16U2, we do have to make some modifications to the code, since it includes references to port E. So go through and remove all references to the joystick and buttons headers. Do the same with the LEDs, since they heavily interfere with port C, which is what we are using. We will instead write code to detect our own buttons and turn on the LEDs. To do that, head over to the callback HID device create HID report function, where if statements used to check the joystick and button code, you can replace those with your own conditions. I replace in the check for the four buttons on my prototype. Once we are done editing, compile the code by using make. Then, upload the hex file using AVRDUDE like you normally would. If you are still confused, you can find my modified code in the description. And already, we can see it working. The best part is that you can extend this however you want. Since this is USB, you can add further functionality, like a serial port at the same tide as the keyboard. Simply reference the demo projects that are titled with multiple names, like keyboard mouse for example. You can also write custom USB implementations if you would like, but more on that in a future video. There is so much more that can be done with this. If you want to dive deeper or need to debug your program, you can get more information on your USB devices.
If you're running Linux, DMSG is great to see USB device status. Wireshark can sniff the USB packets themselves and is available on Windows and Mac too. Well, this video is getting rather long, so I'll end it here. I plan on making more USB related videos in the future. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video and learned something new, please consider subscribing so that you can see my other videos. Have a good one!